You are listening to The Adam Messer Show, and I am your host, Adam Messer, here on WRUULP Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings Community Radio with Global Soul. And I am pretty excited to share with you today. Today is the first ever Savannah Day declared by Mayor Johnson. And we are we're celebrating it today here in the studio. Uh, I'm pretty excited to have my special guest with me, Jeffrey Ray Hayes. Jeffrey, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Good afternoon to everybody. Yeah, good afternoon. I'm pretty excited. Uh, Jeffrey is uh, a graphic designer, artist, painter, um, you name it. Very creative person. Uh, he has Plasma Fire graphics. And if you've been paying attention to the Valhalla Books page lately, which I've been talking a lot about, I've, I, I was talking about uh, this when I had John Stamp on. But uh, Jeff, you were the one that created um, the new logo based off of my original logo. You updated it for me yep. uh, for Valhalla Books, yep. which is really awesome. And then you also gave us some gold flair to it, which I, I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> and then you've also Hello. designed and created um, John Stamp's new series, the Jackson Cole novel books covers and the art for that. And upcoming Winfield Strzok's new release, Red Sounding, re, uh, Resurrected which is uh it's like an anniversary edition uh release with Valhalla books yeah. so i'm really excited i love the artwork that you've been doing uh, you also have like a ton of other uh projects that you work with with uh, authors and writers and things like that so welcome man no thank you very very much i appreciate the opportunity anytime we can talk about art and illustration and and creativity i love it so i'm looking forward to it yeah, I do too. Uh, Sebat and everybody playing at home. Uh, Sebastian is not in the studio today. They went on a little road trip. Um, you know, he's a musician, so they they uh, they went down and were, they're checking out uh, this really cool music store um, on the road. So they'll, he'll be back so next no, week. No guitar backup today. Well, ha ha ha! Guess what I have, Jeff. Uh oh. Um, and I'm gonna play a little bit. Um, it's going to be, you'll be able to hear it in the podcast, but it won't, for some reason, the soundboard won't play it, but I do have a recording of Sebash playing. So I'm going to play a little bit just so we have it for posterity. (laughs) Awesome. All right. So here's Sebash and everybody noodling. So for everybody uh, playing at home, that was Sebastian playing a lick that he did a while back. Um, And Jeffrey, like I said, uh, it'll be on the uh, podcast. So uh, we have some technical difficulties. I don't know. Maybe it's probably operator error. (laughs) But uh, with our soundboard, like it'll play through the computer and it'll go out on the airwaves. But um, for some reason, when I port my aux into my phone, which is how I do these phone calls to the soundboard, uh, a lot of times the guests can't hear that and he's not in the studio for me to be able to put it on speaker so you could hear it but uh you'll be able to hear it in the podcast so it's pretty cool cool i love it uh having uh creative people on the show and i love uh having 
Sebastian play. I just feel like it's just another element to the show that uh, kind of just adds, you know, adds something special to it. You know, absolutely. It's it's that's the thing about creativity. It, it, creative people seem to gravitate to all forms of creativity. Mm-hmm. They love music. They love art. You know, they love uh, writing. They. It, I think that that's a commonality. You're, if you Ask most of your guests that are on your show, you know, are they music fans as well? You know, yes. Are you, you know, may, they may not be TV or movie fans, but, you know, you're going to, I think everybody is a fan of music and everybody is, has some sort of artistic thing, something they like to look at and listen to. Mm-hmm. I think we're sound and sight based folks. So that's, I love that stuff. So. Oh yeah, I, I agree completely. Um, speaking of that, you know, the, cool thing about working with you for the covers and the cover design for John's books and then also uh, with uh, Wynn Strock's book, uh, Red Sounding, um, mm-hmm. I think it's really cool how you are able to take a concept, and I, this is part of you know, the creative process too, but being able to take a concept where someone has like a vision in their mind of what they're you know, wanting, right? And they mm-hmm. describe it to you, and then you put it together on a canvas, and you know you create from there. And you know, could you talk a little bit uh, about that process and how you take uh, you know some open-ended questions and descriptions, and then you know transform them into these amazing covers that you do and the art? Sure, sure. I, that's why you know I've always. Uh, uh, you know, there's different forms of art, and I've always gravitated to illustration art because you're essentially telling, you're trying to tell a story through um, a, a singular image. I'm not a, I, I wish I could do sequence art. I would love to be able to do comic books and tell stories that way. Um, I love comics. I, you know, I, uh, I love, I always gravitate to the covers. You know, yeah. For some reason, cover art has just something that gets me excited. So I've always been interested in illustration. Um, you know, as when I get the information from an author, I sometimes can get uh, uh, very little information, and they just say, you know, uh, it involves a, I need a spaceship uh, attacking another spaceship uh, around a, a blue planet. It can be as simple as that, and then I, I, you know, then it's whatever. All bets are off, and I can kind of just do what I want. But then I, uh, if it's specific to someone's story and they're real concerned about the uh, the character uh, and how the character is portrayed on the front, that's when I have to get a lot of information from the uh, authors. And like uh, John's books, uh, his two were interesting. Um, because we had had a conversation about uh, he, he doesn't he likes readers to form uh, the image of the characters in their minds, and I and and that is something that uh, you know I work with from time to time. We talked about it a little more, and with the type of book that he was, uh, uh, the two books that he was putting together. To me, I, I felt it needed those those characters on the cover, at least a representation of those characters on the cover. And so we talked about it back and forth, and he gave me some uh, general guidelines. Some he, he gave me some scenes out of the story that he felt were uh, uh, key, but that uh, we could, I don't know if you've ever heard the term, you know, hiding the knife. Uh, you know, authors will always they don't want like uh, very uh, specific things on the cover that gives something a plot uh, twist or something away, but um, they do want enough on the cover that tells the reader just as a glance what type of book it is, um, what genre it is, if possible, um, and you know what they're gonna as they're reading this book, what are they going to be reading about? And yeah, they they call to that the, the best way to get. they call that the promise of the premise. Um, with yes, the cover exactly yeah and i think you're completely uh on the mark with that and you do a good job you do a really good job of hitting that on the head 
Um, and you're also uh, one of the things that I, I appreciate working with you uh, is your professionalism. I also appreciate your willingness to, uh, you know, to work on, you know, like little tweaks or, uh, you know, like with Wynn's cover, we had, uh, we had, and not, you know, the back cover is not revealed, but the front, front cover, I just sent it out, um, you know, had a little tweak on it that, you know, it was like one little change, you know, made the whole world a difference, right? And sure, sure. so I think it's so cool, uh, especially in the creative process, because I'm an artist as well, and I've done commissions, and um, I'm not an illustration artist per se. I don't, I haven't really done a lot of illustration stuff like that, but mm-hmm. I love it, and I haven't really done a lot of digital painting and coloring, but I've done a lot of sketching, I've done a lot of, you know, that kind of thing, and that's the same kind of feeling, like when somebody says, hey, can, you know, like last year, or actually not last year, but earlier this year, um, I had a person approach me and ask me if I could illustrate their children's book. And it was like six illustrations for their children's book. Um, and I did, they loved the art and then they wanted me to do the coloring. And I'm like, I'm not really a colorist, you know? So that's something I've been trying to work on and, you know, learning, but yeah, I love it when all those elements come together and you're able to paint a picture, you know, I know not to sound cliche here, but, uh, you know, when you're able to paint a picture with the cover to give that impression of like, okay, well, you know, I see a detective, I see uh, a werewolf and I see a woman with a wand. Mm. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> you know, it gives you, know you an idea. You, absolutely. And you, you, when you go into a store, uh, either a small or, your, or a Barnes Noble type of store or, or anything, or especially if you're shopping online, you, you're going to have tons and tons and tons of images thrown at you. You're going to have, uh, you know, if you're looking for a book to read and you go to an online uh, uh, outlet and you, you have all these covers and you have seconds to try to grab someone's attention because sometimes they know what they're looking for. You know, I want to read a supernatural thriller. I want to read a science fiction story or a, a, they know. And so the, the title may or may not be enough to uh, let them know what the premise is. And so I, what I try to do, and don't get me wrong, learn this. It was not, it was a interesting, you know, I, I used to do uh, gaming art for tabletop gaming companies many, many years ago. And uh, so I did internal illustrations, little a pen and ink things and um, working with those guys taught me a lot about, uh, you know, capturing the buyer, capturing the buyer's eye. Then when I got into commercial artwork, it, that's kind of the in the 80s, won't sit here and t- go back in the dawn of time. But, um, you know, I worked for a, a Texas based grocery company and I did what, uh, you know, standard commercial artwork, which you. You know, when you get your Sunday paper and you open up the ads today, they're um, predominantly photographs, if not completely photographed. Well, in, in the 80s, um, uh, you know, they had uh, ink drawings, watercolor drawings, things. Uh, the product is uh, – was mm-hmm. you there? Color painting. Yes. Oh, uh, I just wanted to, to add to it. Sure. Um, those it's so crazy because I, I worked uh, for uh, Kroger when I was a kid and I remember the ads used to have like paintings and, you know, like little drawings and stuff like that. And I, I think the reason why it flip flopped in the industry and, and, you know, I'd like to get your opinion on this uh, is because it used to be very, very expensive to do photography and to have that developed. And it was a lot less expensive to hire an illustrator to take and make photos, you know, like a realistic, you know, painting or drawing or whatever, you know, something that gets like, if you were, you know, like for Easter, you, you know, you do like a ham, you know, pineapple, um, you know, Uh, you got it, you know, and then today (laughs) it's so much cheaper. I mean, like it costs next to nothing to do a digital photo, um, outside of your time and the quality of these phones, you can take 4k high def, you know, um, and bada boom, bada bing, you know, and then now illustration is more expensive. I mean, like, you know, it, it would cost a lot more for them to do real illustration, not like stock photo type illustration where they could just, you know, uh, hodgepodge right. something You're together. Right. 
you know? You're right. Something that takes time and, and puts, uh, you know, like I remember one of the first jobs I was given was to draw a uncooked, <laughs> an uncooked T-bone steak mm. on a plate with, with a green garnish. Oh, okay. And, um, you know, that was kind of, it was kind of my test. They gave it to me and said, okay, do this. We're going to see if you have any kind of skill at it. And I worked in, in pen, ink, and, and color marker back in, this was uh, early eighties. And, uh, so, I mean, I, I had the, the steak sitting right in front of me, the plate. Mm-hmm. Now having to look at that and move it around in real world space and try to figure out what looks good to me. And then I go through a bunch of sketching and then try to get something to that I needed to. And, they get, and by the way, Here. around the more happy you made them. And so not only do you have to do it to where it's artistic, do it fast yeah um we're everybody we're listening uh you're listening today to the adam Messer show here at wruulp savannah georgia 107.5 fm org. we are savannah soundings community radio with global soul um i have always loved those type of illustrations and paintings and you know especially like the um when I was a kid, I used to love the Transformer uh, toys. I still do as an adult. And mm-hmm. one of the things that, <clears throat> and I cannot remember the artist's name, but the guy that did the box art for Transformers. Uh, Absolutely. I, any box art in yeah, most cases. Yeah. You know, it just. G.I. Joe's, Transformers, all of that, uh, yeah. 70s and 80s. And, you know, yeah. and when the uh, the crazy thing was, is like in the 80s, and the, this is what people, uh, a lot of people don't know about, like these cartoons that were. Uh, 30 minute commercials basically um, they had released and let go of some of the advertising laws towards children like before that you could not advertise specifically to children and so what these companies did was they said hey if we make these cartoons we're not advertising because they're cartoons but they are you know and they used the advertising model with it where they would introduce these new characters every week and there was always a new bad guy and a new good guy and you know the plot was very similar every week and you'd go and you'd look for these uh you know toys or whatever and and a lot of times the box art would look better than the actual toy did you know oh, I, th- I think in most cases <laughs> yeah and <laughs> the uh, box art looked better uh, one of the big examples of like when you're talking about like the uh the mixed media illustrations, uh, the U S version of the comic book and the UK version of the comic book, um, were similar and different. The UK one, they used to do these magazine where they'd have like a mixture of different books or whatever. And mm-hmm. they, they, they came out weekly. The U S books came out monthly. And so the UK version of it, they would do their own cover illustration. And then they got to the point after, the like eighth issue of transformers that they had to create their own new content, but they used this, uh, for all of their coloring, they used watercolors, they used water yeah. paints and it gave such a different feel to the books. And the first ones when they, then this is like talking about box illustration versus like, you know, product versus like, you know, the animation style, the U.S. animation style that they did or the illustration style that they did was completely different than the U.K. one. And the reason was because the U.K. one, they had these toys in hand and they had these artists trying to draw, just like you were talking about drawing a steak, a realistic version of a steak. Mm-hmm. They had these they had these toys in front of them that they were using to create the, you know, the, the images for the comic books, whereas the U.S. one they use the, you know, like a liberal version of the image of like Optimus Prime or something like that. And I always thought it was interesting the way that, you know, when you said earlier that art, you know, we're, we're inundated with advertising 24 seven. We are surrounded by art everywhere we look, you know, and 
everything, every product that is designed, every, you know, like the, the t-shirt that I'm wearing, the jeans that I'm wearing, you know, um, everything was created, you know, with some sort of artistic function in mind, you know, we don't just build a building. We also think about, okay, well, yeah, you got to have the bones, but how do we do the finishing touches so that it's not just a building? It's a beautiful piece of architecture, right? Or right. it's a, pleasant to look at. Absolutely. Yeah. It, you know, it, I mean, if it was a shanty shack versus, you know, a 37 room mansion, you know, there's going to be a lot of differences, but everything we have is, is surrounded by art. And I just love that because it's all storytelling in my opinion. And when you, when you, when you take like what you're, you're working on, you know, any project that you're working on uh, and haven't seen a good sample of your work or your portfolio or whatever, I can, I can feel it. You know, when I look at your work, I'm like, okay, well, you know, here are these different elements and, you know, and it, it's so funny because even like as we've talked, I've been like, hey, you know, you did this. And you're like, yeah, that's exactly what I did. And I'm like, oh, OK, cool. Because yeah, you can feel it, you know. Well, you know, I, a, a lot of this comes from, you know, I grew up. Uh, I'm not going to tell you that I could be your dad, but I could be your dad. Um, you know, I, I I grew up in the the. 70s where I went to a, we had a local bookstore a little used bookstore and it was called half price books and there's two or three of them in the area at the time and you would go in there and you had every you know anything you could imagine that someone would turn in to uh, to resell and on this one wall in in the one that was just down the road from where I lived it was all paperback books and you know paperback books from the 70s and, and 60s and so all you know all the covers predominantly not not every single one but predominantly they were illustrations and yeah. they were now these guys are famous famous artists and but i would look at them and i would stare at them and i knew what i liked and i knew what caught my eye and i used to grab you know i'd say oh that one this one this one this one I love this, and I love how this guy did this. Well, as I got older, I started to realize when I said this guy and this guy, it's the same guy. Yeah. And I started understanding, oh, James Bama. You know, this, this man is James Bama. This artist is James Bama. And then I started looking for James Bama artwork. And mm -hmm. not, all, not all the covers, you know, depending on the publisher, would allow you to put your, your signature on it. And there's even, you know, artists who put their signature on uh, uh, the artwork they did. And then the publisher would come back in later uh, and either crop out or have someone else paint over the signature. Mm -hmm. um, just That's because they just didn't feel that a signature needed to be on, on the cover or the artist needed to be, you know, known. And so, but I would stand there and that it was, a, when I say a wall, it was, you know, floor to ceiling and probably 10 feet, you know, 15 feet wide. And I could stand there for hours looking at books. I barely, if ever, cracked open one of those books. I was more uh, entranced by the those different artists, you know, that would do, uh, you know, Mac Bolan covers or yeah, or uh, the, the Destroyer, uh, the Executioner, and yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the classic, the classic pulp, you know, stuff. Mm -hmm. And and I, golly, I just, I still gravitate that to that today in my when I do my work, I, I actually grew up I in the find 80s myself and, emulating it. Yeah. I actually grew up in the eighties and I would read all the books that my dad read and he was, uh, he was into sci-fi and fantasy and, uh, he didn't really read a lot of horror, but, uh, he would uh -huh. read a lot of fantasy books and those, you know, those high fantasy books, um, you know, like Robert Jordan and, you know, those covers that you're talking about, I, the same thing. I, I had, um, uh, these calendars from 1977 and 78 that were Lord of the Rings calendars. Absolutely. And, and they the were brothers Hildebrand. Oh Love my them. gosh. You know, and I wish them. I still had them today, but I had those calendars when I was a kid and this is like in the eighties, you know, cause I was uh -huh. born in 76. Uh -huh. And, um, but I used to just stare at those, those paintings, you know, and I've always loved, I've always loved that, you know, the, the art of, you know, I, I, not hyper realism, but, you know, um, you know, that same style that you're talking about where 
it's you can tell it's a painting but it also is more realistic than like say uh you know like a cartoon or like a comic book illustration you know right right and then even some of the like like today uh with the ross covers you know right. alex ross a good example yeah. yeah same kind of style you know and he's had an immense success with his art because he's been able to translate that for comic book characters, which nobody ever really did before, you know? Right. And, and I would argue the same things that you like about Alex Ross are the same things that you like about the Brothers Hildebrand. Yeah. They, it's, the, uh, it's the choice of colors, the very saturated. Um, but one of the things that both of those, the artists that you're describing did, the Brothers and, and, and Alex, is they use lighting so intensely and mm -hmm. so well to convey uh, mood in every one of their uh, pieces. That's where I, that's, mm -hmm. that's the kind of artist that I, I just, I would love to be able to be like, I, I, well, I feel I, like you already are. That's one of the reasons why I gravitated I to, to your art. Color. <laughs> yeah. I, I really, that's one of the, uh, that's one of the fields that I, I, uh, I gravitated towards your art because, um, you know, that, that whole canvas of the paintings that you do. Cause I mean, you know, I know it sounds crazy, but to me, a book cover is a painting, you know, I know it sounds really funny, but you're looking at a painting on the front of a book, you know, sure, and, sure. and the kind of paint, the kind of art that you do, I'm not talking about the ones that they're like photos or, you know, whatever. But um, when you have a, when you have a piece of art like that, it is, it's, it is the whole it's like the whole plate, you know, you have everything there, you know, but you have all the different individual elements to it as well. You know, from the, the font, the typography, you know, the lighting, the color, you know, even the positioning of the characters, you know, where you have it laid out and, you know, the, uh, the golden ratio or whatever you want to call it, you know, the way right, that you right, design right. all of those and you put all those elements together, it's not just one feature it's it's a whole experience of a piece of art you know and i feel like that's what captures me when i see something that i really enjoy uh because i with the covers i was a, i was very hands off other than trying to you know just direct like hey you know how can we get this together or whatever um mm -hmm. the authors were the ones that you know said hey this is what i would like on yada 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 and then you know, for me, it was just more like kind of like uh, admin stuff, you know, like, hey, this, you know, what this we need to you know, look at this or whatever. And, you know, but I was not you're the you're the slave driver that says you I need it by this date. Oh, no, 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 I never do that. <laughs> but uh, but, you know, it's so funny because oh, I was really impressed because, um, you know, I did I didn't have any kind of influence over the way, you know, that you were designing it. You know, as far yeah. as like the art and all that stuff, it was just more like me working with you for the final product, you know, and I was really tickled. No, it, it, the best ones, the best ones, to be honest with you, Adam, are, are those, the relationship like that, yeah. where it's, it, it's a cooperative, it's a dance. Right. It's a cooperative uh, back and forth, because I, you guys will think of something that I may not even have had it. an angle of, uh, you know, um, the villain needs to be bigger. I, I've done, I've had that told to me uh, at least three times on projects I've done. They, they said, we want the, the villain bigger. We want them to be, uh, uh, you know, scary. And, and I'm like, oh, okay. And, and it didn't maybe go with the aesthetic I had started designing in my head. But, man, when I got done, they were right. Mm -hmm. It was like, yes, the villain being bigger makes it menacing and makes it, uh, a, a better cover. I love I love back and forth work like that. Yeah, um, I do too. It, I think I would. Uh, the one of the things that I like about working uh, with indie uh, with indie authors and and small press publishers is that ability. In many cases, like when I worked for uh, the grocery company, you know, I didn't I didn't have any input. <laughs> other right. than the product you know yeah. it was uh, you were a machine making the widget for them basically 
it was a machine. It yeah. was machine work. And yep. as it was so much of machine work, I, I did very little artwork when I, uh, in my personal time. Matter mm-hmm. of fact, I, there was, I had a drawing table in my uh, apartment living room, if you will, and it started being the, a, a collector of things. Yeah, uh, you know, it's where I threw my coat, or it's where I, you know, uh, <laughs> I'm guilty of that. Uh, you know, and it, I would never touch it because I was doing all that at work. Hold I that thought, just... Jeff. We got to do the station sure, announcements. Absolutely, go ahead. Um, everybody, you're tuning in today to the Adam Messer Show. I am here with my special guest, uh, Jeffrey Ray Hayes. Hey, Jeffrey, uh, real quick before we do the station announcements. Where's the sure. best place that people can check out information about Plasma Fire Graphics and your artwork? That would be my webpage. That's www.plasmafiregraphics.com. And if not, they can find me on Facebook at Plasma Fire Graphics. All right, great. All right, folks, we'll be back in just a minute. We've got to do the station announcements. And uh, just a quick uh, throw out there. Uh, I want to just wish you all a happy Savannah Day. This is the first ever Savannah Day declared by Mayor uh, Johnson. And uh, we are enjoying it. And... Uh, Yeah, so thanks a lot, and here you go. What does it mean when we say that WRUU is a community radio station? It doesn't just mean that we invite the community to create programming. And it doesn't just mean that we are a voice for the community. It also means that we are counting on the community to keep us going. And you are the community. Almost all of our modest budget comes from small annual or monthly donations from listeners like you. You get to enjoy our community-focused programming because many others have stepped forward to do their part. Now do your part by joining our community of listener donors. Go to WRUU.org right now and make a one-time or monthly donation. And thank you for supporting Savannah's community radio station, 107.5 FM. This portion of WRUU's programming is brought to you by listeners and by the 2021 Savannah Jazz Festival. Due to the moratorium on large outdoor events in Savannah, the Savannah Jazz Festival has been moved. Admission will continue to be free, but a lottery will be conducted for tickets. The Blues Rock Artist of the Year, Anna Pakovic, is headliner for Saturday, September 24th, Blues Night, with Eric Culberson and Robert Lee Coleman performing earlier in the evening. For more information on the ticket lottery, follow the Savannah Jazz Festival on their Facebook and Instagram pages. You are listening to WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings, community radio with global soul. This is Sounds of Tarab from... All right, we are back, everybody, and thank you for tuning in today. You're listening to WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, and this is the Adam Messer Show. And again, I'm your host, Adam Messer, here with my special guest, Jeffrey Ray Hayes from Plasma Fire Graphics, who is an artist and an illustrator, graphic designer, and uh, pretty excited about that. So, um, let's see. Okay. I just had an error message on the computer. That's okay. We'll close this out. That should be okay. All right. So, uh, yeah, Jeff, uh, I think that is so cool. Um, you know, so you were talking about right before the break, you know, talking about the uh, the enjoyment that you have working with smaller uh, presses and independent authors because of that, um, I guess, the openness or the uh, the creativity where you have you have a little bit more leeway other than doing like, you know, just commercial art for a bigger firm or, or whatever, where it's like, you know, you have to do production work and it has to be, you know, we want, you know, this orange polka dot to look this big at this size and, you know, just pump it out, you know, just get it out get it done for us. So I think it's pretty cool. Um, you know, um, over the years that you've been doing the, uh, the illustrations and the, you know, the different things like that. And what, what got you into wanting to work with, uh, you know, going from commercial art and illustration to working with uh, authors to do cover uh, art and design? Yeah. We, that was kind of a weird, uh, kind of a weird transition. I, I have always been, uh, you know, I'm, I, I'm a TV kid. I grew up on TV and 
I love science fiction, fantasy, adventure stuff. Um, I, when I was very, very young and very, very early on, I was a, a Star Trek fan. And uh, I've always loved Star Trek, uh, the original series, um, and, and some, of the, some of the iterations that followed. But um, I guess this would have been early 2000s. Well, even late late uh, 1990s. You remember the uh, Star Wars fan films that that were being made. The uh, yeah. one was called Troops, and and well, I vaguely were... remember them because of the internet. I I don't remember them as a kid because they you know wasn't like something that I saw, you know exactly. But the internet, the internet yeah, there's the a lot of got them out there. Right, right. I remember in the like early like late 90s early 2000s you know seeing this kind of stuff popping up because it's like oh you can share a, a movie file online yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly and so when i saw the star wars uh I, I can't even remember what the first one i want to say it may have been troops or or one of uh, one of those but it doesn't matter you know as i was watching them and watching what people were able to do on their computer themselves and that uh, even in that era uh, you know george lucas blessed that and and allowed people to and even opened up his sound library and the music libraries to a certain degree uh to do those projects something crossed my mind one day um and i said you know i wonder if anyone is doing star trek fan films Mm -hmm. you know certainly certainly somebody's out there that's got to be doing it and so with the almighty power of the Internet, I did a couple of Google searches, and sure enough, uh, there's people in California doing uh, uh, very rudimentary uh, fan films. But there was a, a group up in upstate New York um, that did – and I, I wouldn't even call them rudimentary. They sunk so much talent, so much skill, and so much money into recreating the sets and recreating the uh, – the uh, look and feel of the original series, I immediately fell in love with this, these, these folks. And, um, you know, just like anything in the early 2000s on the Internet, uh, I just shot off an email to them and said, hey, uh, you know, I do artwork. I don't I, – I, I do some photography. I don't know if you guys need anything like that, but I'm happy to help. Um, I love the work you're doing, and, and I uh, – would love to to get involved and so uh i ended up going up to upstate new york i I was a set photographer for a couple of projects got to meet some uh folks because the 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 folks involved in in this production um it it was uh, at the time it was called star trek new voyages and um were people from hollywood and these are professionals that are fans and uh they have the former stars getting involved. You know, they, they, uh, the, the one that I went up for and, and did the most work for was uh, done by a writer and director named Mark Zakri, uh, who has written for tons of television, uh, Babylon uh, 5, uh, just tons of stuff, uh, you know, uh, uh, Ghostbusters uh, animation. Uh, just I cannot – there's so many sliders, things from the 80s. Uh, I love that show, project. Sliders. I loved all the other ones, too, Sliders. but I love Sliders. That was such a great uh, 90s uh, sci-fi show. Beautiful, beautiful premise. I love that show. <laughs> I love that show. But these guys, uh, you know, were not only professionals, but they're fans. And so they got uh, they did this, this uh, production uh, called World Enough in Time. So it was the Star Trek New Voyages, and the episode was World Enough in Time. And George Takei uh, was involved. Uh, oh my a, yeah oh my he was fun uh i got to talk with him a lot because i set just off set you know since i was taking set photography i was just off set and when he's not shooting he would come and sit in the chairs uh and one night late late at night uh he, you know he came and sat down and we got to talk for almost an hour he is a very fascinating first of all he's very kind he's a very kind person uh, very uh, open to fans. I, I mean, I think that's known about him. But for to be able to sit there and just talk to him, just like another person, uh, for an hour was was thrilling. And it it was funny because he 
couldn't, you know, he didn't know my name. He couldn't remember my name, but he did remember earlier when, when we were all introducing ourselves, I mentioned, you know, I'm from Texas. And, and when, when I said that, I said, I'm from Texas. And he goes, oh, Texas. And one of my friends uh, uh, jumps in from, from the side and says, oh, he's from Austin. He's okay. And he goes, oh, Austin. I love Austin. And so uh, that's what he called me Texas the rest of the time I was, uh, you know, on set. And <laughs> awesome. uh, but we had a lot of uh, uh, good uh, interaction. And I pulled I had a little f- uh, photo booth set up there. This is a long answer, but you'll see where I'm going with it. Little photo booth set up, took some photos of him uh, specifically for the uh, poster work that we wanted to do for uh, the, the promotional work that we wanted to do for that episode. And uh, so I did, did that poster, um, got involved with uh, uh, the Cree who started a production in California called Space Command. Uh, all of these things you can find on the internet. Uh, and uh, he got me doing artwork for them, doing poster work for them. Uh, I did some Lord of the Rings uh, tribute film work out of the UK did some more poster work out of the UK, ended up, uh, one, you know, it's, it's all word of mouth. And so one guy talks to another guy or somebody says, hey, who did your poster? Or, and uh, I started doing um, uh, box covers for an audio drama company out of Boston, Massachusetts. And uh, that, was, that was fun. I mean, it was, so, it was working for indie authors. Uh, I never imagined that I would get to do classic covers and, and all sorts of uh, genres, uh, ghost stories, uh, anything and everything uh, I was doing for them. And then one day somebody contacted me and said, uh, can you do a book cover? And I said, sure, sure, I can do a book cover. So I started learning how to do uh, and lay out book covers and, and understanding them better. Uh, to the degree that I thought, well, you know what, uh, I'm going to do what I did, you know, uh, six years ago. I'm going to send emails uh, to some small press publishers. And so I sent one to uh, 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 Prose Press uh, out of Arkansas and uh, understood, you know, what the, the new pulp movement was. And uh, I shot him a couple of pieces of artwork, some of the posters that I had done, and ended up uh, signing a, a little agreement with them and, and did uh, over 125 covers and haven't looked back. As a matter of fact, I, that's what I prefer. I love doing book covers. I love doing comic covers. Um, I have, haven't done a lot of poster work in a long time unless it's promotion for some author's book. But that's how I got into it, through fan films, through tribute films, and, and doing uh, uh, post, uh, movie posters, independent film po- posters, led to working with indie authors, which I love doing. I I kind of have an uh, interesting story how I got into that kind of um, like digital stuff as well. Um, I had a job working overnight at Kinko's mm-hmm. um, back in 96, 1996. And, um, you know, back, I know that sounds really crazy for a lot of folks, but you'll, you'll understand this, Jeff, and you can appreciate this. But, um, a lot of people didn't have computers and a lot of people were not on the internet in like, you know, 94, 95, 96, uh, really it was like after like 2000 or so people started, you know, really kind of getting on the internet. There were a lot of people on the internet, but you know, uh, most households did not own a computer at the time and uh that's right at kinko's they had um they had like some of the top of the line um mac computers for graphic design they had like the oversized color printer um back in the day you know they had all these different you know um they had they actually had uh, a digital camera and uh oh man i think i lost jeff let me call him back guys Sorry about that. Live radio. Or the person you have dialed. Can- All right, we're gonna have to call him back again. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm gonna play some of Sebastian's music while we're waiting. 
Lost you. Whoops, we got cut off. Uh, yeah, I, I'm so sorry. I, I tried to hit that. Um, I'm going right. to bring us back on. So just a second here. I was playing some music. And uh, hold on one second here. All right, everybody. And uh, we are back. Uh, uh, Jeff, I'm uh, sorry about that. Had a little technical difficulty. Okay, um, but yeah, uh, they, had the, uh, they had the top of the line uh, Mac. They had the you know Adobe software and all that stuff, um, and they I want to say that they had this one. It was called PageMaker. I think it was called PageMaker back yep. in the day. And <laughs> yeah, you're talking my language. Yeah, though. and like uh, they had uh, they had like the you know Illustrator and all that stuff. So anyway, um, people would come in because we were one of the only places that could do um, color copying for photos and things like that. So people would bring in like these you know, just different photos and we had, you know, the digital scanner and I mean, this is like mid nineties, you know, so this is like, yeah, I got, you, you know, my first scanner I bought 95 and it was a thousand dollars. Right. Right. So that's, yeah. And so what I did was, uh, I, the first time I ever messed around with something like that was, um, someone had brought in some photos of some angels from a cemetery and it was like these mm -hmm. old black and white, they didn't own the photos. They owned the photograph. They didn't own the photos themselves though. They didn't like, they weren't the photographer and, uh, they wanted to make copies of it and whatever. And, uh, so made the copies and then I just started playing around with it on, you know, Adobe or whatever. And, you know, just kind of like photo, uh, like just kind of mess around with the photo and all that. And, um, and then one of the other things that I did, the very first time that I made my own t-shirt was at Kinko's. <laughs> I drew, cause I used to love to draw. I drew this original character I called rain and, uh, it was in color. It was full color. I just did, I just used markers and, um, you know, whatever. And then I scanned it and I made it into a t-shirt from the, uh, sticker press. You know, you, you do it mm -hmm. and then you press it on with the, 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 the iron on t-shirt presser or whatever. And that was the first time I'd ever made a t-shirt and like I was hooked, but for me, it was more of like, you know, doing you know, stuff for fun. And, um, but I've always been into art, you know, I kept sketchbook and, you know, I would, I would go into these spurts of like, you know, drawing a lot or writing a lot and then not and whatever. And, um, a couple of years ago, uh, I picked up an iPad Air because you can use this program called Scrivener on your iPad and your phone and your computer, and they can all sync up. It's a it's a writing program, and I picked it up because I was you know I was you know really getting into my my writing, and I wanted to have you know something that I could take with me, and not a laptop per se, but you know more so. Um, you know, like this and, and iPads are awesome. They're so, they're so versatile, but, um, I got into, uh, digital drawing for the first time ever with the iPad. And there was a program called procreate, which Great pro that is becoming the program. Now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and, you know, you talk about affordable, oh my gosh, uh, it's like $10 for the license for a lifetime yeah. license. Um, and then this year, my friend, Dave Conray, who is a graphic designer and illustrator and all that, he is really big on using, uh, this program called affinity and affinity has, uh, like a page making program. They have a photo editing program and they have a, like a, a digital, uh, creation program or whatever, very similar to the Adobe products or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. and I, I scoop those all up for $25 a pop and they have lifetime updates and all that other good stuff or whatever. But, um, I got them half off and it, those programs have been so incredible. And there's this other, uh, little photo pro uh, program that I like to use. Um, oh my gosh, ear fan view. And it's, oh, just, I haven't heard of that. Yeah, it's a. Uh, I think this guy is from like Norway or something like that. But it's called Ear uh -huh. Fan View, 
it's just a real quick and dirty photo editor. I mean, it's just like bare bones. You know, it has a lot. It's robust and it's very versatile, but it is just great for like if you want to, um, you know, if you want to do some minor changes and you want to do them really quick or if you want to like say, for instance, uh, I'll use it a lot if I'm doing a screenshot and I want to, you know, crop the screenshot. And so, you know, cause it's just, you open it, it literally just opens right away. There's no loading and all that stuff. It's like, boom, here it is. And, uh, so, but I like that, you know, tool and I got into it and, and I'm not, you know, like I would consider myself at like an intermediate level. I'm not at an advanced level. You're, you're, you're a very advanced level, you know, user and creator. I'm like an intermediate when it comes to digital art, but I tell you what. When I did those illustrations I was talking about that the guy asked me to do earlier this year for the children's book, I used Procreate. And, you know, I'm, I've always been a tactile person where I wanted to create, you know, and, and have that pen and paper or that pencil and paper or whatever. Right, um, right. Using Procreate and the iPad with the, the little stylus that, you know, the, the eye pencil or whatever, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it felt you know, cause there's so many different brushes that you can use or whatever. It felt like I, it was the first time I'd ever done any kind of digital art where I actually felt like it was my art. I mean, before it would be feel like my art, but it also felt clunky because of the, the lines or whatever. And I, and it just, I, it, I just never felt like it was, you know, as accurate as like what I would want to do like on paper, but with the, no, I, with the procreate. Oh my you. gosh. Procreate. And there's another, um, uh, uh, Clip Studio Paint. I have that too. Um, when they used to call it Manga Studio or whatever, I bought yes, it. <laughs> Manga Studio. That is, those two are now becoming the, the, the especially in the comic realm. Yeah. There are a lot of guys that are using uh, those in both concept art and comics. Mm-hmm. And I will tell you this, I probably would jump on top of them if I wasn't if my brain was not filled with so much uh, uh, Photoshop painting style and and uh, uh, Corel Painter, um, matter of fact, I, I used to use Corel back in the day about, too. Yeah, it's I painted Paint Shop Pro <laughs> ink and watercolor up until 2008. Yeah, I pre- I was predominantly. Uh, I mean, I would use Photoshop to do. Uh, the movie poster stuff. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, I didn't use it to paint. I didn't, I didn't think, I didn't understand it well enough to understand that you could even attempt such a thing, a, a real painting, digital painting style. Mm-hmm. And I went to a school, we were lucky to have a school um, uh, just south of us here, uh, and uh, it was a concept art school, and they predominantly a trained artist for the gaming industry. Oh, uh, so a lot of concept area. art and all that. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so, um, because I was working full time, I couldn't obviously go there full time like these, these kids were, mm-hmm. but, um, they had some summer instructional courses and one of them, uh, they, uh, Roger Barcelone was the artist, uh, a guy with 40 years of experience wow. talking wow. about someone who could turn, traditional his traditional art style and this is a classically trained artist Mm -hmm. uh who was a commercial artist through the late 50s 60s 70s 80s and into the 90s and then um made that transition from uh from traditional to digital without even a blink the the man uh became a corel master painter because uh, it's a tool the, the, it's just a tool yeah, and he's the artist exactly, i love that exactly. jeff thank you so much uh we've we've got to wrap it up for the show thank you so sure. much uh, i definitely would love to have you back on the show and i would love to talk more about painting and art and stuff like that Man, that was fast yeah i know it goes by quick <laughs> uh where's the best place again that people can check out your information and as well as your art Absolutely. They can hunt me down easily on the web, www.plasmafiregraphics.com, uh, or find me on Facebook, Plasma Fire Graphics. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jeff. And uh, stay tuned, everybody, because the next hour...